Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rechtenwald. Hello everyone, Cedar Creek Radio is on the air. Luke Shortridge hanging out with the Andy Rechtenwald. Andy, good to see you, my friend. Good to see you too as well, Luke. You're uh, looking snappy today. Great to, Always. great to have you on board. Hey, thanks. Love you it. too. I like that jacket. I know they can't see it, but it's a I like that sweater that oh, they can't see. This is so nice. Man, our beards look good too. <laughs> <laughs> Eric? Okay, keep moving on. So, uh, <laughs> thanks for joining us today, guys. We are in the book of Exodus. Yeah. Uh, moving right along here in the Old Testament. We are. And, uh, you know, Exodus begins the story of Moses, yes. who is an important character yeah. in the Old Testament. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, mm-hmm. we, we believe. Allegedly. Conservative. <laughs> I think we believe. We do believe. Okay. So uh, <laughs> we're going to begin today uh, telling a little bit about the story of Moses, who okay. as a young baby was, you know, placed in, among the reeds, which is where the name Moses came from. Okay. And it got me thinking about babies and names and the importance of names. Oh. So I was thinking about celebrity baby names. So here's what I got, Andy. I have some celebrity baby names for you. <laughs> well, and i got to ask a question. Yes. So every there's always a tie to the trivia. How long does it take you to come up with the idea for the trivia? Doesn't matter. <laughs> well, longer than I want to admit. There's you, never like you, a, I don't you, know, I just I just pick I, I mull it over usually for about three days. <laughs> I'll just be like, okay, Moses, baby, Moses, celebrity <laughs> baby names. Of course, it's so simple. It's right there in front of me the whole time. So I have some celebrity baby names uh, for you. And because yeah. I know these are tough, I know it, I've given you multiple choice. Oh, wow. That's so nice yeah. of you. So I'm going to give you the We're celebrity really baby names. really helped name. on the other trivia. You then I'm going to give you four like, celebrities or celebrity couples. Trivia. And, and I want you to tell me who are the parents to this celebrity okay. baby. Oh, jeez. Okay. Right. First one is Cal Eel. Cal Eel. K A L hyphen E L. E L? Yeah. Cal L? Maybe it's L. Cal L. Okay, yeah, what, is, what are my I multiple choice right. options here? Okay, first one is Dwight Howard. Second one is Shaquille O'Neal. Third one, Nicolas Cage. Fourth one is Tupac. I'm going to go with B, Shaquille O'Neal. That is incorrect, sir. Darn. Okay, A. That is incorrect, sir. Okay, Nicolas Cage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently the original name of Superman... When he was born on Krypton, was Cal L or Cal Eel? Cal, I think it's Cal L. Okay, we'll go. With I that. wouldn't know. I don't like Superman, but yeah, that's right. You hate him, don't you? He's so lame. You're a Batman guy. Oh yeah. All right. Well, let's keep moving on here. The next name is Pilot Inspector. I've heard Pilot of this before. Inspector. Your choices are Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Ben Stiller, or Jason Lee. Jason Lee. Yes, that's I don't even correct. know who Jason Lee is, but yeah, I, yeah, great job. That's why I guessed it. You can Google him later. So okay. good. What's he been in? So is this trivia basically parents who hate their children? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. There's a pilot re- inspector. Is pilot inspector? What the heck? Pilot inspector. I don't know, man. The, really, it, Jason the, Lee? The what only thing I can think. Yeah, he's been in a lot. He's been in like Mall Rats. Yeah, and they, he spells it funky too. Yes, with a K. What an idiot. Um, the only thing I can think, Eric is these people live in an echo chamber of praise where everything huh. they do is amazing. So no matter how dumb the idea is of their baby name, everybody tells them it's amazing. That's the only well, thing I can I mean, think. pilot inspector. My gosh. I mean, I get when they when, like when you make up a name, like it's a word that people have never heard before, but it can still be used it's as like a name. It's like a job. Like, pi- yeah, Come on, I'm construction sure worker with a K. Somebody in the Air Force has the job of pilot inspector. It's like keeping the pilots in line. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my geez. gosh. Like, th- that right. is so frustrating. Right. Anyways, let's, go ahead. Let's just move on. You know what? Andy's he's getting... Scientology. So oh. he's in Scientology. Probably what, part is, of it. what does that mean? They're all weird. <laughs> I bet you John Travolta's kids are on this list, too. <laughs> Maybe. All right, let's keep going. Gosh. All right, your next name is Apple. I know this one. Gwyneth Paltrow. Well, and the guy from Coldplay. Whatever. Yes, yeah. that's exactly how I wrote it. Yeah. Gwyneth Paltrow and the guy from Coldplay. <laughs> Seriously, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you want to hear what the other Press options were? Right? Yeah. 
Jennifer Lopez and her backup dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Munn and the guy from Radiohead. I just made that up. And then Pam Anderson and Tommy Lee. So That's amazing. Great job, Andy. And the guy from Cold War. All right, next up is Coco. Coco. Your options are Courtney Cox and David Arquette, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, Britney Spears and Kevin Federline, or Sarah Palin and her trashy daughter's... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where that one was going. <laughs> so obviously that's not it. <laughs> uh, what was the first one again? Courtney Cox and David Arquette. I'm gonna go with that one. Yeah, well, you're right. Okay. Whew. Yeah. Well done. It's uh, it's based off of her name, Courtney Cox. C O. Yeah. That makes sense. They, okay. They, they were gonna do even that. It's weird, it but it's weird. not Pilot Inspector. <laughs> it's not great. Gosh. I mean, how how many times are you gonna get called Coco the Monkey? Seriously. Coco, Coco Buffs? <laughs> no idea. Okay, let's keep moving on. I thought Coco was the kitten, not the monkey. Coco. Oh, no, Coco from... Uh, Coco for Coco Michael Cri- Cri- Crichton's... Uh, no? Uh, I don't think so. Which was the, What was the gorilla novel that Crichton did? What was uh, it called? Congo. Congo. Oh, no, Congo. Could you imagine being named Congo? <laughs> I, I know there's a famous monkey named Coco somewhere. I know it. I'm just not placing sure. it. Sure. I mean, I wouldn't right. doubt that. Let's keep moving on. This is well, a good a one. It's a K-O-K-O, I think. All right, let's, let's just focus on the task at hand here. Got it. <laughs> Kid. K-Y-D. Kid. Okay. Was it Brad and Angelina, David Ducatney and Tia Leone, Jillian Anderson and Clyde Klotz, or Dick Tracy and Tess Trueheart. <laughs> um, what was it B again? David Ducutney <laughs> and Tia Leone. I'm, I'm guessing that one. Yeah, you're right. Wow, I'm doing pretty good. You are doing pretty and good. So far, except for, uh, very random. except for Apple, I've guessed on every single one, but I've been right. So they wanted to be able to shout, hey, kid, and secretly know that it was spelled with a Y. <sighs> oh, that's so cool. Morons. All right, here's a good one. Ready? Gosh. Sage Moonblood. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Sage, Sage Moonblood? Moonblood. Is it Sylvester Stallone, Jackie Chan, Jean-Claude Van Damme, or Arnold Schwarzenegger? Um, Moonblood is the daughter's middle name. Oh, my gosh. Jean-Claude Van Damme? Nope, Sylvester oh, Stallone. Really? Yeah. That's so disappointing. It's kind of cool. Sage, Sage, I, I get Dude, it. Dude, it's not the worst name it's out there. It's not the worst name, but Moonblood... Yeah, Moonblood. Probably should just go with. Sage. I guess he is Rambo. I mean, it's. That's right. First Blood. First Blood. Been a better name. Okay, next up is Destry. Spell it. D E S T R Y. Okay. Destry, and every time I typed it in, the word destroy kept coming up. <laughs> Maybe it was a misspell. Is it George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, or Stewie Griffin? <laughs> <laughs> Well, James Cameron's kind of a weirdo, so I'm going to pick him. Incorrect, ah, sir. Dang. Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg. What, is Destry. there any behind, like, what's the behind I the... Have no idea. Couldn't yeah. find anything Freaking on it. Freaking Destry. All right, next Not up as is... as bad as Pilot Inspector. Memphis Eve. Memphis Eve. Memphis Eve. Is, is it name. Bono, Steven Tyler, Mick Jagger, or Elvis? Mick Jagger. Nope, it's Bono. Dang. Falling apart here. Yeah. Memphis Eve is... It's not terrible. It sounds cool. Yeah. Memphis Reigns is Nicolas Cage's yeah. character in Gone in 60 Seconds. I, sh- I should have put in <laughs> Nicolas Cage again. <laughs> Memphis Reigns. Yeah. Anyways. All right. How about Ocean? Mm. Ocean. Is it Felicity Jones, Rivers Kumono, Mark Wahlberg, or Forrest Whitaker? I know the last two. As Rivers Kimono is from Weezer. I'm going to guess Felicity Jones. Incorrect, sir. Dang, who is she? It's Forrest Whitaker's son. Hmm. Ocean. Ocean. He said he wants his son to be expansive and that he tries to be revitalizing and constantly growing like a forest. <laughs> yeah. So here's hoping that his son doesn't become a huge, salty, smelling fish. <laughs> All right, next one. Prince Michael II, also known as Blanket. 
Oh, that's Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Prince. No blanket, no. Michael Jackson. <laughs> Prince William or Prince Albert in the can were your... Oh, uh, blanket. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I, I got all these from Cracked.com, which used to be a magazine. Mm-hmm. And uh, the description on this was, you can really chart Michael Jackson's journey in the crazy town with the naming of his children. <laughs> when his first kid was produced somehow in 1997, <laughs> produced, <laughs> he gave him the pretentious but not quite yet insane name of Prince Michael Jackson. In 2002, another boy came along, and Michael, completely out of name ideas, called him Prince Michael II. You'd be expecting his nickname to be the Revenge, but instead Michael started calling him Blanket. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was a great description. All right. Uh, Next up is Rocket. Rocket. Is it Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Martin Scorsese, or Alfred Hitchcock? Rocket. Uh, what was B again? Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, Martin Scorsese, or Alfred Hitchcock. Quentin Tarantino. Come on. Good man. guess. Robert Rodriguez. I don't even know who that is. Uh, Sin City. Is he the director of those? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Famous director. I've never seen Sin City. Um, Shark Girl and Lava Boy. Nope. Okay. Isn't it Shark Boy and Lava Girl? I don't know. I just. I saw it on there when I looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> You're naming it like you've seen it. <laughs> Come on. Shark I tried to pass it on. Everybody's seen that one. All right, next up, Moxie Crime Fighter. <laughs> Moxie Crime Fighter? Moxie Crime Fighter. I guess you got to give me the choices. Pen Juliet. Pen Gillette. Pen Gillette. Gillette, that's it. <laughs> David Copperfield. <laughs> Chris Angel or David Blaine? Uh, Chris Angel. <laughs> nope, it's Pen. <laughs> Pendulette, Moxie, Moxie Crime Moxie Fighter. Moxie Crime Fighter. I think that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's still a name. It's still a name for your Moxie. kid. Yeah. What are you naming your kid? Policeman. All right, last one. This is my favorite. Your Majesty. <laughs> Your Majesty. <laughs> Your Majesty. Is it Jermaine Dupree, Jermaine Paul, Jermaine Jones, or Jermaine Jackson? I like what you did there. Jermaine Dupree. It is Jermaine Jackson. <sighs> Your Majesty. Majesty. <laughs> it's your kid. Man, it's your kid. <laughs> oh, it's a human being. Can you imagine Your Majesty at 60 years old? Oh, my god! Talking to his grandkids. Call me Your Majesty. Call That's kind of weird, Grandpa. That's my actual name. Ugh. Amazing. Anyway. This was fantastic. Yeah. I really like this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier with the multiple choice, although I still missed half of them. Uh, you did pretty good, Andy. Okay, I'm proud of you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Well, let's go ahead and get into our text then. There is no easy transition from celebrity nope. baby names to Exodus, but we're going to make that now. Uh, so if you want, uh, Andy, tell us a little bit about the book of Exodus here. Yes, yeah, so the book of Exodus, as we mentioned earlier, written by uh, Moses, took, takes place anywhere. What really, does his name mean? Uh, the, in the reeds or something? Among the reeds. Among the reeds, yeah. Um, it's really written, it seems to illustrate that God will fulfill his promise that he made to the patriarchs yep. to uh, make Israel into a great nation, and also to show that God is ultimately in control. Um, it's written to, or for the purposes, or the audience that are reading it is going to be the Israelites in the ancient Near East, so the people that, Moses' contemporaries and people after Moses. Yeah. Um, written, or it takes place, really, they're not, scholars aren't entirely sure, it's all up in the air, it could be anywhere from 1446 B.C. to 1260 B.C. Hmm. Um, in that time frame, it's tough because there's no specific, the Pharaoh's name isn't listed, and so it could be any Pharaoh. Um, the setting is in ancient Egypt and also Sinai. Key people we're going to see are Moses, Pharaoh, and Aaron. Um, and then uh, the mega themes, there's really two two major themes. God's in control, it's his providence, and his promises. So his providence and his promises um, are the two mega themes throughout. Um, I think, too, you, you'll also see some of the most dramatic miracles of the Bible in Exodus. Yes. And that does go to show, as you said, that God is in control. Yes, and I think another one I'd probably add just off the cuff is the theme of, um, the, the Passover theme is, the, is redemption. Yeah, right it's, it's the, you know, redemption. So we're going to see the book is uh, split up into about five sections. You'll see in the first couple chapters um, transition from where we left off in um, Genesis. Joseph and the Israelites have prominence in Egypt, but now they're slaves. That's the first couple chapters. Then we see Moses being called to go free the people. Then you have the interaction with Moses um, and Pharaoh from like chapters 5 through uh, 15. And it's then, a biggie. Yeah, big one. 
Um, then 15 through 18, you have the actual exodus occurring. And then 19 through really the rest is like the covenant at Sinai. And a large portion of that, um, like I think seven chapters, is um, instructions for building the tabernacle and all that. So it's a, it's a, it's a large book. The majority, the front, it's very heavy on the front end. The, the back end is a lot of description and not really narrative. Cool. So we are going to check out chapters 1 through 11 today. Uh, we're going to be flying through, and if you want to join us, you can pull out a Bible at this time. We're going to be in the New Living Translation. Uh, we're going to have some questions as we go along as well. Feel free to stop the podcast and discuss if you're with a group of friends, or if you're by yourself, you could journal if you would like. Uh, if you're driving or working out or doing something else, don't worry about it. We'll do our best to answer <laughs> the questions, and we'll just keep moving along here. So Uh, Exodus 2, 1 through 10 tells us about the birth of Moses. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. When the the baby's sister then stood at a distance, watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Hmm. Great story. Great story. All right. So, Andy, uh, kind of break it down for us. What What's happening here? Why is Why is Moses in a basket? Yes. We, <laughs> <laughs> He's in a basket because the Pharaoh had um, issued a decree to kill all of the firstborn men because uh, the Israelites were getting so populous, so huge, and he was afraid of um, them becoming too large of a, pop, a people and then overthrowing the government. So he Infanticide? Is that the term for it? The what? Yeah, infanticide. Infanticide. Yeah, so he, commit, he, he says to go out and kill. And you see in Hebrews 11 in the New Testament, um, the writer of it says that the reason why um, Moses, Moses' parents did this was not out of fear. He says that actually that they saw the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Huh. So they trusted for some reason that God had a purpose through Moses, their son, and so they shipped him off because, really, if you think about it, they knew he was a Hebrew when yeah, they picked up the baby. Right. So they had a, they knew for you know, um, his parents knew that there was a plan. They had to have known. Um, so you see that God's providence initially in the first couple chapters, even though this evil Pharaoh wants to kill all the firstborn male children, um, Moses is protected by none other than his his uh, his daughter. Yeah, you know, so pretty Strange. crazy. Why why do you think Moses' mother still gave him? Up when he came of age, why did she give him back to Pharaoh's daughter instead of just hiding or protecting mm. him? Or it's a good question. I, I mean, spe- it's, a, I guess it's speculation. speculation. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think she knew that that he was going to play. I mean, I think God put it on her heart, though it's not in the Bible, that she knew that he had to play a major role in the um, in the Egyptian government and in a sense to to help maybe free the people. Yeah, I, I think part of it comes down to the fact that the Hebrew people were slaves. We were not treated well, and, you know, our regular life, if you will, here was a life of slavery yep. and manual labor, and the chance to grow up in the palace, to be educated, to maybe get some power, as you said, or see the world, um, that was a very unique opportunity yeah, that would have sure. been given. Definitely. Um, but, it, I mean, there's no guarantee. You hand him off, and you right. may never see him again, yeah. and you Crazy. may never find out what happens, right? So, uh, Andy, talk about a time that you struggled to see God's hand at work. What happened? Um, I mean, we've talked about it before, but I, for the first year and a half, I think I worked at the church. I was, um, part time and I was, I was, I maybe foolishly banking on going full time. So Kayla and I were going to get married and living on my part time salary while she was in hair school. 
<laughs> ramen noodles was a, were a staple <laughs> food. It's like living in, a, you know, as a bachelor in college, but married in a small apartment. But um, it wasn't terrible or anything. It wasn't. I, I think looking back, you, we tend to romanticize those times. Yeah. Like it was like, man, baby, it was just me and you together. Right, yeah. We didn't have anything but love. Yeah. Not. Nah. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, like, but when you're going through it, it's yeah, terrible. You're like ramen noodles. <laughs> they actually suck. I'm, I'm sick and tired of them. <laughs> yeah. um, but we, you know, you ever seen the salt contents for ramen? It's terrible. It's terrible. like ten it's days worth salt. of salt in one pack. You just kind of take the salt, mash it into a thing, and then it becomes noodle. I love it though. It's I, I really <laughs> it's enjoy the, it's it. the staple food for college students. Um, but you know, it's hindsight's twenty twenty. But it was an opportunity, and through that time, like we didn't know, and it wasn't really in the church's control at that time to, to move me to full-time, and there were some crazy things that happened, and there was an opportunity, and God blessed us um, with a full-time salary. So uh, it was definitely a struggle, though, to see, like, you know, I thought because we didn't, we didn't anticipate, church didn't anticipate uh, financial hardships that we had at that time. We were right. in f- hiring freeze, and, yep. th- you know, they were like, we want to put you at full-time in the summer, and I banked on it, so we got married in the, you know, and then it was like, poof, everything blew up. Uh. And, so, I mean, we've all, I think anybody that's on staff has been through a season at the yeah. church where the money's just not coming in the same way, so. And the fear of the unknown. Oh, know, yeah. When, when all those things are up in the air, is mm-hmm. really difficult. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I would say for me, um, I, I think I've told this story before, but uh, my son became very ill and sick when he was nine months old, my oldest son. And part of that, the nature of his injuries and how it uh, came about was we were investigated for child abuse. Yeah. And being... Being investigated like that, I mean, it was so surreal. It felt like a movie. Like, this cannot be real life. This can't be actually happening. And getting interrogated by police detectives and doctors Ugh. and, you know, have you ever hugged your son too hard? Have you ever disciplined him too harshly? Right. You know, all these questions were, were just like, no, no. And it, it took a long time to get medically cleared and to prove our innocence um, but I just remember that feeling of people kind of staring at you and weighing in their head, and the, the allegations right. were so horrible. Could they do this? Are they? Um, it was just awful. And uh, God, God has used that in many ways. And one one unintended way I did not expect is I've had a chance to connect with probably a dozen families who are being accused of things sure. for all different various reasons. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not God, so I don't know everybody's guilt or innocence. I, it's not my job to, you know, judge them in that moment of are right. they guilty or not, but what it has given me is compassion. Yeah. It's given me compassion for those who feel like they are in a fishbowl, their life is under a magnifying glass. Right. People are looking the, at them and thinking horrible things about them. Yeah, you're able um, to be empathetic because yeah, you actually that's have right. in there. Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. And without going through that horrible circumstance, yeah, um, I wouldn't be able to help those families and connect with them as I sure. have. So, that's awesome. Uh, one, one, Andy, why don't you take us to Exodus 3. We'll start at verse 1 and go through 22. Great. says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But, Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name. Now, 
and my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me. He told me, I've been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, peasants... Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. I could have, I almost nailed that. The elder of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to set, to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go, and I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Well done, sir. So there's a lot happening here, a few kind of themes that we're hitting up against that I want to point out. Uh, the first is the importance of the land. The Israelites are people that don't have their own land. Yep. They grow into a, a great prominent nation mm -hmm. while being slaves in the land of Egypt. Yep. And God promises to lead them out to a promised land here, a place that they would have as their own, a land flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. Um, this is a very important dream uh, for the Israelites, and it continues really to be a dream today. Yeah. Uh, the nation of Israel as we know it in the world today was... Was it 1946? Yeah, around I mean, right out of World yeah. War II, I believe. So it, it's a relatively young nation uh, to having its own state. Um, but the dream here that's that's very important for the Israelite people is a place of their own, uh, a land that is their own, where they can reside and grow. Um, this the land is very very important to them. It's yeah. tied to their yep. tied to their hearts, tied to one of the promises of God, and it really shows His providence and abundance. <clears throat> and the way that he will provide for them. So another important thing that's happening here is, uh, and we forgot to mention it, but Moses flees the land of Egypt. After, yeah, after um, killing we kind of skipped over Egypt. a part there. Yep. You can uh, go back and read that for yourself, or you can watch the movie Prince of Egypt if you want. Uh, but <laughs> Moses, when he, uh, when he leaves the palace, he wanders for 40 years. So he's about 80 years old when this... Uh, story here begins when he sees this burning bush and when he meets with God and speaks with God uh, I, th I think it's amazing here that God reveals a little bit about his nature and revealing his name uh, the name here that God gives him the name of God is it's a four-letter name yod heh vav -Hey in the uh, Hebrew language yeah. it's known as the tetragrammaton the four-letter name the, the important name of God this name is revered and important in the Jewish faith uh, because God instructs Moses later to not use his name in vain. Right. The vowels uh, for the name uh, have kind of been lost. So we think it's Yahweh, but we're not even entirely sure right. because the people just stopped saying it because yep. they didn't want to say it wrong. Um, it, there's kind of this mysterious element around God's name, but it, what it's translated to, what it means is, I am. So God just says, I, I am. His name is, I always have been. Yep. I always will be. Yep. I, I just am. It's the, uh, it's the thing, it's the thing that separates God from every other, I mean, other than, you know, obviously his, his perfection and all that stuff, but it's, they call it his, uh, his ontology. He just exists. That's right. He exists. He State always has. There's, yep. He's always been, um, it's, that name is, is super powerful. It's interesting. Um, even Jews today, many Jews today won't even, when they spell yep. out God, they take the O out. Right. They'll just put G hyphen D because they don't want to use the vowel, and it's a way of yeah, not saying as as a people, you know, they would prefer to the name, but they wouldn't say the name itself because yep. they didn't want to say it in an unholy or an unworthy ma yep. matter. Um, that's part of where uh, the name Jehovah comes from. So it's translating the consonants uh, with the vowels of Adonai, master. Mm -hmm. So the, the pronunciation, if you've ever heard of Jehovah, it's really a misnomer. It's a mispronunciation yeah. of the consonants for Yahweh, but the vowels um, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So uh, when, we, when we think about God, we think about the name. There are many names for God. Uh, yeah. The Bible uses many names. I'm just curious, Andy. Uh, here's my question. Do you have a favorite name of God? Yeah, I don't know if I have a I don't know if I have a favorite name of God. Um, but the first thing that popped into my mind was I have a friend whose family every year growing up they would each pick a different way to refer to God for the whole year. Wow. So in their prayers, um, each of the person in the family, like my buddy, one year had Redeemer is what he prayed to God. He prayed to his Redeemer huh. the whole year. Cool. 
and he said it was a really cool practice for him growing up because it allowed you to see God for his different um, different aspects. So God is a redeemer. He's also a judge. He's also perfect. You know, yep. he's a, all yep. these things. So those aren't necessarily official names of God per se, but um, I thought that was really that was yeah, just something cool. really cool. So I don't know if I have a favorite name of God, but that that popped in my head. What about you? I, I like the name Lord. Yeah, Lord is that's my go-to. Yeah, it, it just I don't know it like. I'm kind of a history guy, and it brings up. Uh, I remember like my my grandfather praying. He's passed away now, but uh, just praying, praying, uh, Lord, um, protect me, come for me. I, it's just I find strength yeah. in it, and just kind of the the idea that God is in control. That yeah, He is present in there, and um, I think that's pretty cool. In in the ancient world, names were very important. Uh, if you knew the name of a deity, you could call upon it, and perhaps yeah. put it under your thumb. You could. Uh, call upon and ask things of that God. So the, the name of God would have been very important because no, Moses, oh, yeah. no, when he goes back, they're going to say, which God appeared to you? What's yeah. his name? Yep. And uh, Especially in Egypt where it's, they had tons of gods, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah. they had a God for the sun, the moon, the stars, everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I do think it's kind of ironic here that God's name is I am and then nothing. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. like I am. Right. I am. That's That's the only name that he needs. All right, let's go to Exodus 7, 1 through 13. Aaron's staff becomes a serpent. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pay close attention to this. I'll make it seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything that I commanded you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn, so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, so I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. And when he does, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded him. Aaron threw down the staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called his own wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. Hmm. Whew. Well, yeah, it, it's so crazy here because it says God forced Pharaoh's heart to remain hard. And yeah, yep. I think it, it gets into the idea of free will here where Pharaoh doesn't get to choose and decide. I mean, if God yeah. did that to him, uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, this, their theologians debate this um, extensively, and this gets into, um, I, I'm sure you're aware, the whole Calvinism, Arminianism debate. This is this is a lot of it centers around Pharaoh's heart, especially yep. if Romans 8 mentions it. Right. Um, because Paul says that God will make vessels for use of this and for this. Yep. So I've heard a couple different things. One is exactly the way it seems, which is that God needed Pharaoh to show his wrath and to free the Egyptians to be um, resistant to God's call. To let them go, so he hardened his heart and made Pharaoh resist. I've also heard, um, which this the other that doesn't leave really f- free will intact for Pharaoh in particular. So yep. it's, that's a difficult view. Um, but the other view I've heard, which I which I think is is also um, just as biblically sound, is that um, God in saying that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That previous to this, Pharaoh it had already said that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. So it was Pharaoh had been doing it, and then God continued to allow Pharaoh to do it. So it's right. almost like a not God actively hardening Pharaoh's heart, but but not softening Pharaoh's heart. So almost a passive thing. So okay. I think both okay. both have biblical evidence backing to it. Um, it just depends on which yeah, way you my, want to interpret it. My position it. is I don't know. It's a troubling passage. Yeah, it is. It, it it seems to me that God gives us free will and allows us to choose, but mm-hmm. it seems in this passage that Pharaoh didn't have that option. Nope. Uh, you know, it's possible, you know, some will say it's revisionist history that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, so Moses just says, well, God caused that to happen, but right. he didn't really understand it. I, I don't know, man. I don't think, I mean, yeah, that's tough to take, if, especially since he says, you know, he says that God did it. You know, you got to take the Bible for what it says, but it is, it's a tough passage. I mean, it, it especially when you take into account what Paul says about it, you're like, oh, yeah. that's tough. Now, it, it is possible this was an isolated place in time that because God had wanted to show the miracles that he did temporarily suspend oh, yeah. Pharaoh's will. Yeah. But 
Anyway, irregardless, think about a person who had a hard heart toward God, which later changed. What happened? Um, I, I got one. Let me yeah, go, go first. Ahead. All right. So I, I was thinking about this, and uh, there was a girl when I was a senior in high school. She was a freshman. Her name was Rachel. It's now uh, Bueller, and she goes to White House campus, which is pretty cool. But when I met this girl, uh, she was your... I'll say stereotypical late 80s kind of emo goth yeah. type kids. All black, Marilyn Manson shirt every day, yeah. black fingernails. Um, she she stood out. Uh, sure. Um, you know, from, from the uh, normal preppy right. high school that I went to. And uh, my buddy, uh, Brent Perley, ended up uh, talking to her about God and inviting her to youth group. And I remember we, we went to this bowling night. And she showed up, and it caused a little bit of a scramble in our sheltered youth group of Christian kids that are like, "What is the Marilyn Manson girl doing yeah, here?" Right. Like, you know, it, it, you know, people are coming to me like, "Is it okay that she's here?" And I'm like, "Yeah, of course it's okay that she's here." <laughs> and no, no, uh, I, I remember, you know, it, talking to her about God and Brent did as well. And her heart was very hardened toward him for a lot of reasons. And uh, over the course of about six months, she became a completely new person. She started reading her Bible, started coming to church, and uh, I, I just saw her life change and transform right before mm, my eyes, which that's was cool. pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I wonder if she still likes Marilyn Manson. She could be a podcast listener. I may reach out and find out if she still does. But <laughs> it, it was just cool for me to see to see her heart soften toward God and to open herself up to Him yeah, and definitely. accept Him. It was pretty cool. Yeah, um, I mean, we've, I've seen it happen with students. When you're in student ministries, you see it a lot because yeah. they're not they're not expecting grace from church and whatever. There was one. Uh, her name was Lizzie, and she was like a very same same kind of thing. Not the Marilyn Manson type stuff, but very anti, um, very uh, just resistant. And and through the course of, she just would come to Vertical for a year and a half, I think, and then went on a mission trip, and then slowly you see her <laughs> heart softened, and she, she started following Christ, which is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, I would say for each of us, I, I don't believe God creates anybody to be condemned. Yeah. I think that he wants all of us to come into a relationship with him, uh, but I believe he, he does give us a choice. He leaves it open to us. And uh, in this particular instance, Pharaoh chose to say no, to have his heart hardened, uh, but if you have somebody in your life that has a hardened heart toward God, don't give up on them because God can do um, amazing, miraculous things. And you never know how he uh, continues to work. So uh, w- what happens here next is a series of plagues. Mm-hmm. Um, Pharaoh's heart remains hardened. Moses says, Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh says no. And Moses works a miracle through the use of God here, mm-hmm. um, and a series of plagues happen on Egypt. He turns the Nile River into blood. Uh, there's a swarm of frogs that overtakes the city. Lice, flies, diseased livestock, boils, thunderstorms of hail and fire, locusts, darkness for three days straight, death then of all the firstborn sons. Yep. And that, that really gets to the Passover, which we'll, we'll get into more next yeah. time. Um, But this series of plagues that happen, again, it's some of the most dramatic miracles of the Bible, Mm -hmm. um, happen for God to show his might and his power. And it happens because God is using Moses um, to show that God's not happy. God's God's ready to save his people, and he is on their side, and he is all-powerful and in control for for all time. Yeah, great. Cool. I think the the funny thing about the plagues, funny or maybe um, interesting, is that each of Ironic. the plagues, uh, maybe, maybe each of the plagues, um, when you look at the gods of Egypt, they can be tied to a oh, particular yeah, god's reign. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. like you know the god of water, the, the right. Nile River, the god, of, and then there's so like God was showing his superiority over yes, all of these the so-called Egyptian deities gods. of Egypt. Yeah, it's very fascinating. It's, yes, especially since like we were talking about. When you're in such a, um, a, 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 a a society of like many gods, a plurality of gods yep. who they thought they could manipulate, God says, "No, you can't. They're not real, first of all, because right. I'm going to show they're not, and you can't manipulate me. And I'm going to show you that by this, 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 yeah. this goes for." And the magicians that Pharaoh had in court, they're able to produce some of the miracles, but at some point they stop. Yeah, and they're not able to reproduce everything yeah, exactly how how he did. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Andy. Well. <laughs> 
we uh, we're gonna have to wrap it up here. Do you have any concluding thoughts for this first part of Exodus? I think it again we see that God's in control and He's got a He's got a plan and it's gonna happen re- regardless of our efforts. Yeah, I would say God is still at work today. He's still redeeming yep. people, uh, whether our hearts are hardened toward Him or not. He never gives up on us. Yep. And he's always kind of manipulating the events around us, I believe, for our good and to show us his power and his yeah, nature. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, uh, we love Exodus. We hope you get a chance to dig into it to yourself. We'll continue on with that next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andy, how do people get a hold of us? Facebook, Andy Rectumwald, Luke Shortridge. You can also email us at podcast at cedarcreek.tv if you want to give us some feedback or you want to request a, we talk about something. That'd be kind of fun. Um, you can also review our podcast in the iTunes store or uh, the... Five stars, please. Yes. If you don't, if you're not going to give five stars just email us your just review tell and us we'll decide why. whether or not we'll change it if yeah. there's something you don't like we'll don't, fix it you don't like how much Eric's talking we'll put an end to this <laughs> uh, yeah so give us a good review share it um, on your social media pages so other people can access the content love it yep great job Andy alright well Proud next you. time is buddy you did a great job thanks you did a great job too that was really encouraging yeah yeah super nice we're gonna wrap it up we're gonna wrap it up bye <laughs> see you guys Exodus 2 next time Exodus 2